It's a pleasure for me to introduce uh, Franz uh, Joseph Point from uh, Fraunhofer, ITWM. Franz? Yeah, thank you, Mauricio, for the introduction, for the invitation. So it's the first time since two and a half years I'm back to Houston, so it's a pleasure for me to be here. You know, we had some travel restrictions from Germany <laughs> and the other way around as well. Uh, but today I'm here, it's a pleasure to me to speak about actually the first time on a conference at all about the new processor architecture that's coming up. Uh, we call it the STX uh, processor. It accelerates RTM, but it accelerates as well other codes. I selected RTM since it has a special relationship to the RTM world. Um, hmm? Now, this doesn't work. Okay, now, yeah, I think I think we can skip the agenda. Um, I will start with the historic remarks since uh, actually working on this topic since a few years. Uh, where I first met met Mauricio, where I was already at no at Repsol no? in Barcelona. Yeah. Um, so uh, we had been working with the IBM cell processor, and those of you might remember that Repsol was the first company really adopting this and running the IBM cell with with RTM it was a really a breakthrough, I think achievement at that time. Uh, we had an IBM cell as well on our side and we really liked the architecture, in-order cores, scratch pad memory, really things you, as a HPC guy you like. Uh, might be a little bit too complicated to program for lots of people. Um, <coughs> and it was very, very high efficient. Yeah? But IBM abandoned this in, in 2010, so it's a pity for us. So, there's something on there. I have no influence on this. <laughs> uh, somebody tried to call in here. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so we started a, a new development, uh, a specialized architecture, following similar ideas, actually uh, looking, looking for, for a, a new system using Tensilica a process, Tensilica course at that time, and uh, tune it for RTM was work uh, done together with, with John Charles from Lawrence Berkeley Lab. Uh, <coughs> and there are some simple design principles for doing this. Uh, actually, this is a citation from an ACM paper from 2020. Uh, designing a new ship architecture is really a form of parallel programming. Uh, we are HPC guys, so we know this, how to do it. And that's what we, we did actually, develop a ship from the perspective of a developer of scientific codes, not from the hardware side. That's a completely different approach. And you see there are four, four things basically you have to be good in. Data specialization, parallelism. You might too want to achieve a high degree of parallelism. Local and optimized memory architecture and reduce the instruction overhead. These are the main, the main points. Uh, and we looked actually at stencils. You know, RTM is basically stencils, wide, small, different kinds of stencils. Um, <coughs> and this is like not a good fit, fit for AI-optimized AI hardware, uh, but it is a good fit for, for new things. Um, we call this green waves. Actually, John Schalf started with something looking for climate simulations. We said, John, you will never get money for doing this. Uh, let's look at oil and gas. Maybe there's more money to build such a processor. <laughs> and we, we did this then in, until 2013, uh, together with him and Marty Denerov. Marty Denerov, I don't know if somebody of you know him. He is uh, an architect, former silicon graphics guy, and now building a uh, graph engine processor in Silicon Valley. It an in, was an in-order in score with scratch pad memory, tuned for RTM and climate simulations, 28 nanometer design at that, at that point in time. Uh, 700 cores with hybrid memory cube, old stuff. Uh, 32 processors per node, and with an RTM TTI performance at that time of 102 giga stencils per second on a node. Uh, we later come on to more numbers. 
Um, if you compare it with an NVIDIA A100, that's today at 32 megacent per second and what. And this was already the big deal. But at that time, it was at 13, 2013, I think the oil price was, was just starting to go down. <laughs> uh, so it was a actually a difficult time to get forward with that. Um, and to get money from investors at that point in time was as well difficult. Everybody was investing in software, not in hardware. It's totally different today, yeah, if you look at. Um, so what is, what is the stencil processing unit? So we started this again in 2016. Say, so okay, now is a, is a new time. Let's rethink the whole thing uh, and look at a wider class of algorithms. And the design, in principle, is core from scratch. So this is not anything you know. That's a, a completely new uh, architecture. And we want to incorporate RISC-V. RISC-V is basically the management of the system. So the host, in our sense, is a RISC-V RISC system, not anything else, not an IBM or AMD. Uh, what we want to do is an efficient execution of mass kernels on volume points. So this is more or less a constant access pattern that you execute in a repeated time, but the, the access pattern stays the same. It uh, doesn't modify from step to step. So this is a kind of stencils, type of stencils. C and N's like are the same kind of access pattern stencils. And this development is then since 2018 sponsored by the European Processor Initiative. I don't know if anybody here in the US knows about that. That's a European activity to develop a new European processor. There will be an, uh, an, ARM, an ARM type of processor coming out of that. And this is another uh, result of this. There will be as well some kind of vector, risk-based, uh, risk-five-based vector processors coming out of this. And again, somebody likes to log in here. Can you <laughs> remove that? And this is spending uh, about uh, yeah, 200 million in Europe to, to do this. And we are part of this initiative. And you see we are already, I mean, this morning we heard about wind simulation. Uh, there's an, another area of application, especially when you want to do um, direct Navier-Stokes simulation to tune the, 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 the blades of the wind turbine. Uh, this is typically a calculation of that type. And as I mentioned, develop this from a scientist. I'm a mathematician, maybe a mathematician's point of view, not from the hardware developer's point of view. So, and that means it should be easy to program. You basically write your code down as you would do it as a mathematician, and that should execute, point. And that should execute with the highest possible performance. Should be as simple as that. Achieve some kind of general programmability. I mean, that's, that's a difficult part. Uh, so at the moment, it's more, more focused on this type of. And if you look at, at say, a, a, yeah, one type of RTM, a VTI RTM, there is this uh, access pattern yeah, that's very regular here. That's typically very easy. Uh, but in addition, you want to have the same thing for the irregular patterns around that, that this is executed in parallel and scales as you like with the number of cores. So include all that in this parallelization uh, in this program. Now how, so that's now, I mean, the details I still keep a little bit hiding. Um, the SPU core, how is it done? It's a, first, it's a small, very large instruction word architecture. So this word is short, not too long, to make it easy for the compiler. Uh, it has two parts, this, this core. Uh, one is an address generation unit. You know, when you have this stencil access patterns, you have to do a lot of address calculations, and they are accelerated by this address generation unit. And we, you have lots of looping in this. Yeah, you do the same, have the same operation which you loop around. So there is this looping is supported by hardware. So basically, you, you, your summation, you can download it directly to the core, and it's executed. It's all done in hardware. And there is some support for data flow organization. And on the, on the say, uh, FPU part, yeah, there are two FPUs uh, with 32 or 64 bit. And basically, we are doing four cycle, four operations per cycle. 
uh, with one cycle access to the uh, scratchpad memory. So ideally, you have full access to memory uh, when you want to operate. That's, that's a rough picture how it looks like. And there is a very short op uh, instruction set. Um, the, the individual uh, stencil processing units, we put the, a bunch of them together, which are then managed by RISC-V, a core, and they all have together access to this L1 scratch pad and, and can communicate with the rest of the systems who are very fast interconnected. Those, those, we call this a micro tile, and those micro tiles, they are then put together to uh, create a, what we call an STX chiplet, which then contains about 500, 500 SQU calculation units. That's the main point. Make it really easy to write high performance code. Avoid any large porting and tuning efforts, like going from formulation like this, say, in an afternoon to an STX code. So the compiler and the programming, that's, that's as well the difficult part. And we have a few principles we have been following. The compiler and the STX system, so the architecture and the compiler is developed concurrently together so that, that it can, can think about, could we make the life for the compiler builder easier? Uh, so make a simple design that allows the compiler to do the job. It's a short instruction word. There is no vectorization at all. You don't have to think about that. Second thing, keep the portability of the software. The only thing you have to insert is an open OpenMP instruction. OpenMP target, boom, SPU, that should be done. There are no intrinsics and it's one code, one code for the host and the, and the accelerator. And there's no cross compilation. Third, we want to achieve 80% of peak performance just by compiling without touching the code for further tuning. Um, yeah, we use, as everybody, we heard it this morning, this morning by the ECP project, the LLVM compiler is what you, what you do today. Uh, it is a, a very well understood architecture, very good architecture, and you can, can insert the code you like on, on every level. Uh, the most work is certainly the backend, compiler backend, uh, and there you have all the optimization steps to tune for the architecture. So we have now the STX here. We have done this compiler work, so the compiler is working. But still, there is room for further optimization. I will show a result here on this slide. So this is now, uh, we don't have the, the full hardware available. So this is a result to shift on the simulator with a single, single SPU, uh, with two FPUs on, on the SPU, with uh, one gigahertz clock frequency, and you see these red lines here. So this is the theoretical peak that you could achieve uh, just by the, the character of the kernel. And this is what just is the output of the compiler. So these are more or less more than 80% of peak performance uh, for a bunch of benchmarks. And you see here various RTM variants, uh, the FFT, uh, uh, this is quantum chromodynamics, uh, and these are some parts from, from the machine learning side. And the idea is that you, in, in modern code, you very often have the mixture of machine learning and classical simulation that you can put this together and do it on the same, same architecture very efficiently. And as I said, on this, on this result, there is no hand tuning. You certainly could get a little bit nearer to the red line, if you do some hand tuning, but OK, five minutes. Uh, let's come to the results now. Uh, what we expect for the hardware when it's, when it's there. So the hardware will look like, like this. We have uh, 128 of this, this STX clusters per shiplet, which runs at 1.1 gigahertz. It's, it's not a very expensive 5 nanometer something. It's, it's a much cheaper architecture as the 12 nanometer FinFET global foundries which could be produced in Germany. Yeah? We are not depending on anybody else. Uh, 
The memory is a 16 gigabyte HPM2E. So this is a really fast memory interface uh, attached with the PCI Express 5, 6 when it's coming, and CXL, it's for making access to remote memory easier. And the total power of a shiplet is 35 watts. Okay, 35 watt uh, energy consumption. And these are the, the expected results for uh, various variants of RTM from acoustic uh, isotropic to elastic orthotropic. Uh, this is the number of floating points. There are some variations in algorithms which might have more or less floating points, uh, floating point operations per point. And this is the, I mean, we don't talk about flops. Yeah, We talk about mega stencils per second, really application performance. And you see we achieve here 5,871. Uh, and this line means if the memory is, is it oversubscribed or undersubscribed. So I mean, these are more memory intensive uh, kernels. So this is oversubscribed and here there is still some room. So we could, we could go for some little SIMD ex extension and get even better values for that. And this was 35 watt. And here's the, yeah, I mean, and we're supporting directly the plane scheme that you typically use in RTM uh, for your where you keep your, keep your planes, uh, I don't want to go into details. Um, and that's now the direct comparison with uh, the NVIDIA A100. Uh, we have two SPX tiles. Uh, they consume 70 watts. Uh, the number of mega stencil is 11, 11 giga stencils per second. And if I do the calculation of per second and watt, it's 152. And the A100 has 250 uh, 50 watts, and that's that's the number of mega stencils and uh, corresponding uh, mega stencils per second per watt. So uh, this is the advantage is not not only on the energy side. Uh, so performance is excellent. I mean, we are thinking of putting four tiles together on one processor, so on one on one interface, so that you have a much better performance than A100. Um, as as well, since the chip architecture is pretty cheap, the processor will be much cheaper than an A100. Um, and you have the ease of coding, especially when you are a scientist and are developing new code. Yeah, you can just compile it and get, get good, good results. Compare, we, we choose the, the TTI, uh, RTM TTI, since we have, uh, I mean, the values here at the NVIDIA website, uh, which which we can compare. So this is tuned code, not tuned by us, but by somebody else. So obviously should know how to do it. And this is how the real hardware, uh, an SPX cluster looks like. And the first test chips are produced. And, and from the software aspect, I mean, this Brands, is your- you have one minute. Yeah, yeah, it's the second last slide. <laughs> uh, you just insert the OMP target, SP. S S S P U and and that's it. Um, next steps. On the research side, we we are going to start uh, funded by the EPI project with a next generation of this. Oh, we have still have some uh, ideas to improve even the the compiler. Uh, and on the on the the second step is really go from research to product. That's where we are now. Uh, we build it on the Europe side a pilot system where we integrate multiple accelerators. So this is the first version of that. There are some as well some, some vector accelerators in it. And then we are going to produce the, the processor shiplet and, and the board such that we will be able to deliver full systems uh, at some point in time. Some acknowledgments to the main, so this is, as you can imagine, not a very small team that does it. It's uh, Jens Krieger from the HPC department at Fraunhofer. He does more or less the chip architecture and the software stack. Actually, he did his PhD with, with John Schauf in Berkeley. And Norbert Schumann from uh, uh, the Inti Institute for Integrated Systems at Fraunhofer. And there's another Fraunhofer uh, that does interposer design and production of the interposer. We can do that in-house inter interposer production. Uh, and uh, as well supported by uh, the ETH Zurich, Luca Benini and his team and by the European Process Initiative. Questions? We Thank have you. Time for one two questions. One or two questions. How, how does it factor in with like the, the, the hardware, the scaling, the presentation? 
Yeah. The size of. Yeah. Is it more effective for larger samples or? Uh, I mean, we we have tested this with with uh, variant. We have our own RTM code which has a variable variable uh, dental size. I mean, the benchmarks are typically eight point stencils, uh, but you can can go as high as, as twenty. Uh, can I ask another question? Yes. So for the comparison to A100, uh, you're going by uh, actual consumed wattage or by TDP? It looked as if you're going by um, sort of theoretical wattage. Sorry, I can see the, the question. It's in Zoom. We don't, <laughs> we, don't, we don't have a view. It's just God talking to you. So what was the question? <laughs> so the question is for the comparison that you're trying to establish of performance per watt. Yeah. You seem to be using theoretical TDP um, values. I assume your 70 watts is not a measured during the execution, but a theoretical no, and no, definitely this, the 250. The 70 watt is the, 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 yeah, the maximum power consumption of the facility. Right. So have you done an actual measurement based on what the uh, hardware is actually consuming we, for both we types? Do, we don't have the full shiplet available at the moment. We only have, say, little pieces like, like four to eight SPUs just on the testing side. Okay. And, and, and you can't really measure power for that, I see. Yeah. No, mm -hmm. I mean, the, the, I think mm -hmm. the, the power consumption should be reasonable. The reason that I'm asking is that uh, it's it's not clear to me that for a kernel that is memory bound and based on the five kernels that you showed, even though I remember from Jan's thesis, at least back when Greenwave was being looked at, some of uh, there was one of the kernels that was actually compute bound until you did some common sub exception sub expression elimination. Hello. Yeah, the, the, so the screen wave Hello. side, I mean, that was a completely... Memory bound, but different. usually for memory bound kernels, a GPU is not hitting its peak power. 